Good morning and welcome to this special homecoming conversation about contemplation, discernment, and Ignatian spirituality today, sponsored by the Georgetown University Alumni Association. I'm Mary Prahinsky, College Class of 85, Senior Director of Advancement for Mission and Ministry. We are delighted to have so many of you join us from across the, gl across the globe for today's discussion with Father Mark Bosco and Father Greg Shendon. You can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen when they come to mind. We will review as many of them as time allows later during this session. Let me introduce our panelists. As Director of Campus Ministry, Father Greg guides the chaplains and staff, staff of our multi-faith Office of Campus Ministry in its service um, in its mission as a vital resource to all students and as a leading partner in the work of the intellectual, social, and spiritual formation across the university. A graduate of John Carroll University, Father Greg entered the Society of Jesus in 1997. He has graduate degrees from Loyola University Chicago and the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley. When not tending to his ministerial responsibilities at the university, Father Shendon can be found uh, tending to his own spiritual formation by admiring Mark Rothko's works at the National Gallery of Art, taking in live music at DC venues such as the 930 Club and the Black Cat, or striving to make poetic connections between Gerard Manley Hopkins and Kendrick Lamar. Father Mark Bosco is Vice President for Mission and Ministry and holds an appointment in the Department of Theology, or English, and he also teaches theology. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, Father Mark joined Georgetown after 14 years at Loyola Chicago. As a scholar, he's focused much of his work on the intersection of theology and art. Um, he is also co-producer and co-director of the NEH supported film Flannery, which won the 2019 Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film. You can also watch Father Bosco on a G GU Alumni Association series of conversations um, webinars. With that, Father Mark and Father Greg, I turn the session over to you. Well, thank you, Mary, and thank everybody on the homecoming team. A strange homecoming, huh, Greg? I mean, everything's a little bit unprecedented today. Yes, well, and it, uh, it does um, invite us into the question, doesn't it, Mark? Um, what do we mean by home? Yeah, yeah, it's very true. I think in many ways uh, this pandemic, this uh, has really forced us to really ask some hard questions, or not, not hard questions, questions that we usually keep on the sides of our minds, you know, off to the side, and they're now coming very, very much uh, to the center of our lives. So what does it mean to be at home? How does it mean to belong, as, as I know you like to say, um, Greg, uh, especially the Georgetown uh, at this moment? Right. I mean, and then you bring up, you know, uh, that word belonging and... <clears throat> As many of you know, uh, you know, in our mission statement for campus ministry, we talk about uh, the um, our guiding mission in campus ministry is to assist our community here at Georgetown to find, and this is important, to find greater and deeper meaning, purpose, and belonging. And Mark, as you just said, I think in <clears throat> this current moment and where we're at, uh, we're, we're 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 desiring to look for meaning at new levels. We're desiring to look for purpose at new levels. We're desiring belonging at new levels. And yeah. for those, un, and I, I, we've overused the words unprecedented and uncertain, but as for, for, uh, at, for, for as unique as this moment is, I think um, it, can, it can seem like a really daunting thing to look for meaning in all of this, purpose right. in all of this, right. belonging in all of this. But I think as, um, as a Jesuit institution uh, rooted in our Ignatian tradition, um, this is mission territory. And it's a moment where it can be daunting, but it can also be a time of incredible creativity and imagination too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about that, that word belonging too, because um, I think that what, what Ignatian spirituality reminds us, and really what I think what we try to offer our students is this, 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 we, 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 we switch the question up. It's not so much, who am I? Because that's kind of in your isolation. You can kind of like, not who am I, but to whom do I belong? And, and that that is somehow going to be uh, the grounding for who we are. That it, we really say, I belong to my mother and my father. I belong to my friends. I belong to Georgetown. I belong. I belong to a community on a journey. 
So I do think that's really kind of one of the things that people are kind of sensing that's quite in, in the world today is that who, where do I where do I belong? Who do I belong to? So um, I think it's really an important thing. It's really been a, a, a pleasure to um, have what we call the silver linings are the the, the, the the those hidden graces in this. And I do think that um, one of the hidden graces is we've been able to share you and I and other Jesuits have been able to share. Uh, the spiritual heritage of Ignatius, the spiritual exercises. Uh, we've, we've been able to kind of meet people where they are uh, in, in, in their prayer uh, and in their question. And you bring up a great point there, and, and that has been a huge, and Mark and I have talked about this time and again, and one of the greatest gifts that uh, obviously that Ignatius gave the church and the world was um, was not the founding of, you know, great schools with, you know, great academics and great athletics. That's all like icing on the cake and that's all wonderful stuff. But it really, it really is. Um, it's this spiritual worldview that we're able to share. Yeah. And uh, so much a part of it, and, and Mark, I think you'd agree with this. Um, you know, you look back to the very foundations of the society and I'm no historian, we could pull John O'Malley into something like this, but you look at the very beginnings and you know, they were from the beginning, a community in dispersion, right? They didn't all stay together in Rome, mm -hmm. you know, for as much as Ignatius wanted to be out where the needs aren't being met, he ended up in administration at home in mm -hmm. Rome. Yeah. Uh, but the rest went out, but, you know, uh, you know, and John O'Malley, uh, uh, the historian always talks about the notion that uh, of anybody writing in that century that we have letters still collected from any person in that century, in the, in the 1500s, we have the, the largest number of letters from St. Ignatius of Loyola. Yeah. And I bring all this up, uh, not just for a nice little historical fact, but it's the fact that he was not just being an administrator, but he was also sharing this new spiritual tradition via letters. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't, you know, it sounds silly, but I mean, he was using the social media of the time to spread this spiritual worldview. And were he around today, would he be on Zoom doing it? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I, really, I really believe that. No, no, I, I think it's a great insight. Uh, and there is something about being at a Jesuit university or Jesuit school where it's how do we get our own energy, our own sense of, 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 of life? How do we kind of get ourselves with our moral compass set on a place so that we can share, that we have something to share? that we have something to share to the world, to the people we love, to the commitments that we have in the world. And so one of the things I think you know, we, we might do in this uh, time we have uh, on in this homecoming uh, session here is to kind of maybe just talk about what would, how does Ignatian spirituality work uh, today, especially with the cloud of COVID-19 over us, um, things like that. Um, and I guess for me, I, for, my, for me, the first thing that I ever experienced about Ignatian spirituality as a young novice was when somebody said to me, a novice master said, your desires are important. Mm. And you keep on praying as if you think you have to put your desires up there on the shelf and like you can concentrate or something. Just go to where your desires are and see what the deepest desires. The problem is with you, Mark, is that you have a lot of superficial desires. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you kind of just quiet those other desires? To see what's the deepest desire. And I do think that's one of the greatest things we, we can offer people is that your desires are actually a, a pathway to God. Just be careful that you have spent some time in silence, in reflection, to say what's the, what, what desires are deeper than other desires. You, you bring up a lot of great points right there. Uh, I was uh, in a class with Dr. Jean Lord a few weeks ago that she does small seminar on um, vocation and purpose. Right. And we talked about this very issue about desires. And I talked about the difference. And again, as you put it, Mark, you know, there are these competing desires in a sense, and there are the deeper ones, and there are the ones that might seem more su superficial. And I was I, I framed it in 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 terms of trying to discern the difference between wants and needs. Mm. And we can want a lot of things, right? right? You know, I can, you know, I don't know, want a, a, you know, a new iPhone or I can, but then when we start talking in terms of need, 
we're getting into that notion there, Mark, that you brought up in terms of when we talk need, we're talking about what is essential to, to go back to an earlier point of yours, who and whose I am. Right. You know, and we get down into that. And one of, I bring up that class with Dr. Lord because one of the students asked the question, I thought it was beautifully, um, beautifully put. He said, how do we discern the difference between really, really loud wants and really, si really silent needs? That sounds like a Georgetown student. I mean, you know, very good. But isn't that a great way of putting it? Because we do have a lot of, at any time, uh, and, and in this moment, we have a lot of very loud wants, but we also have those silent needs. And that's where discernment comes up. And that's where, again, as, as a gift, uh, Ignatian spirituality can really, um, can really be a wonderful gift in that process of uh, first quieting, so as to listen, yeah. and to hear, yes, those rather loud wants sometimes, but also to listen for that, you know, one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 46, you know, be still and know that I'm God. Yeah. To get into that. Yeah. You know, I think you're right. I, I guess, I guess that's like the great thing. Um, Ignatius teaches us using in the whole Christian history really teaches us that, that you will, you will sense the movement of God in your deepest desires. So that by you, you silence all that stuff, not just to know what your desire is, but because God uh, almost is effusive there. There's a sense of of a bubbling up, uh, a sense of a presence that you that you kind of know you're a more authentic person. You know you're a more authentic self when you've quieted that down. And I think the quieting is very important. So I think the two things that Ignatius always gives us the spiritual exercises and the examen, the daily examen, to remind us whose we are, to right. be in gratitude, and to spend some time in doing that. But I do think the desires are so, so key. I was reading uh, Denise Levertov's uh, poem, Primary Wonder, uh, this morning. And there's that one moment when I think we all have to do this every single day where she just says, you know, days pass when I forget the mystery, problems insoluble, and problems offering their own ignored solutions jostle for my attention. Mm. They crowd its antechamber along with a host of diversions. My courtiers wearing their colored clothes, caps and bells. And then once more, the quiet mystery, it's present to me. The throng's clamor recedes. The mystery that there is anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything, rather than void. And that, O oh Lord, creator, O oh hallowed one, you still hour by hour sustain me. And I was thinking about that, that. That's really what Ignatius says. That's the first place. Can you get, if you can get there, God can really work with you. And God, you are literally communicating with God if you can get there. Because you have taken that moment of wonder and awe. That, that, I loved in that poem, Mark, the, and, and your, your, your recitation of it was, was wonderful. But that, and then. <laughs> right. right? Isn't that fantastic? Right. right. <laughs> But it is it is moving in into that space, you know, and you know you brought up it, you know, in that to to move into that quiet space where we come to to recognize more explicitly, and I think that's the thing. God's always with us. We know that. Yeah. But yeah. to recognize that more explicitly, that God is present, and something else that 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 you just said there, you know, and it comes straight from you know. Um, in the fourth week of the exercise, spiritual exercises, you know, a, a God who, you know, is co-laboring yeah. with us and for us, right? you know, and again, that sense of, you know, first off, this is all God's initiative, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. to recognize, because all too often, and I think in these days, it's like, what do I need to do? I need to find my deepest desires. I need, I need. Yes, I do, but it's a we. It's yeah. it, it, it's a group. It's a it's a, it's a group project. You know, it's it's a God who yeah. co-labors and co-creates, and we're invited into that co-laboring and co-creating uniquely, each of us in very different ways. Right. Yeah, I do think I do think the spiritual exercises are, a, are really a, a pathway into knowing who you are, 
knowing your desires, knowing it, and then wanting to, to, to follow Christ, wanting to follow God uh, in that kind of depth, to live in, in, in a deeper place. In some ways, I like when we use the word magis in, in Ignatian spirituality and the Jesuits, and I was always more and more and more. I like, I heard it once used by uh, uh, as deeper, that the magis really means deeper. So when, when Ignatius says do the, uh, do the more, do the magis, he's kind of saying do the deeper, more authentic uh, thing uh, as opposed to that which is on the side. And I do think we, we spend our days thinking, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? And we think more and more and more, especially in our culture. It's like, no. Pick and choose the deeper desire, the deeper thing, the one that will actually maybe allow others to, to be empowered by your life, by your witness. See, that, thank you for bringing up the majus and kind of that. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. It, it, often the majus can be misinterpreted as saying yes to more and more and more and more and more things. Um, and Mark, we've talked about before, a tremendous human being and uh, theologian here at Georgetown, Monica Helwig of Happy Memory. And when I was teaching high school, she gave uh, all the faculty staff a day of recollection. And she spoke all about Ignatian spirituality. And she brought up that point of the magis. And she said, you know, she said, we talk just as you said, Mark, we talk about the magis as the more and, and we, we interpret it. And here's a bunch of high school teachers and administrators right. where it's all about saying yes. To more and more things. There's another game to go to. There's another essay to have students write and correct. All of that. She said, when we keep saying yes to more and more and more, and I'll never forget her doing this. She said, we keep saying yes to more and more and more and more and more. And we spread ourselves so thin that we're of no good in furthering the kingdom. She said, sometimes yeah. the ma just means saying that dirty word, no. <laughs> which I thought was great, but then she got into exactly what you just said and said, sometimes the ma just means doing precisely what you're doing right here, right now, but doing it more mindfully, more compassionately, right. more lovingly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going deeper with who and whose I am in this moment right. and, living, and living out of that. And, and just if I can say one more thing, you know, in terms of discernment, discernment, you know, and that's what you know, what you were saying there, Mark, and what Monica mentioned, discernment really, on a surface level, discernment is from good versus bad. We, we, but that's pretty clear cut. Yeah. Real discernment is discerning a good and another good. And that's when we talk about the greater good. And that means saying no to something that is good. You know, you're so right. I mean, we've gotten to really the key thing that I think Ignatian spiritually does. How do we make decisions? How do we make good decisions in our lives? What is discernment? I was, uh, I was uh, with uh, Peter Fulham the other day. We were talking, another Jesuit here teaches the problem of God, as you know. And I was saying, um, my first moment of that was when I was entering the Society of Jesus. And I was living in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. The lower, I was, you know, teaching at LaSalle Academy on Second Avenue, Second Street. Kind of a bohemian 24-year-old. I mean, I was, you know, certainly an Italian-American Catholic boy, but I was really enjoying myself. And yet at the same time, I had this like, you know, you really should think about becoming a Jesuit. I was like, where did that come from, you know? But, and I went to a spiritual director who was living in America house. And I said, I don't know what's going on. I mean, what's the right thing? And they said, well, it's not about right and wrong. You think that one's a good choice and one's a bad choice. And that, you know, he says, those are both good things. You're teaching in a high school. You're, you're having, a, and being a Jesuit is a call that you feel it, they're both good. Now the hard work, what's right. the deeper good? What, what, what's gonna kind of come down and actually, you know, be the deeper place for you. And that was a revelation to me. That was a revelation to me that it's not about good versus bad. It's about the good and the good and a deeper good. And I think one of the things that Ignatius spirituality and really spiritual direction does is it keeps on reminding you of that, that everything is a good, that God can be found in all things. And so we can't say it's about judgment. It's about what's what's the better good and the deeper good. Um, I like the way you just phrased it too, you know, because we often talk about the greater good. I like the way you just phrased that by saying it's discerning the good from the deeper good. You know, that's, that's a beautiful way of putting it. And again, back to that point about it's good versus deeper good, or it's trying to discern which good, right. um, as opposed to good versus bad. 
because it's funny, uh, students, I'll often talk to students on retreats and just, you know, one-on-ones here. And I was, uh, I didn't enter the society until I was on the verge of my 29th birthday. And I was living here in Washington and doing all the things that somebody in their 20s does. And I'm much like you on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, and I always explain to them because somehow they think uh, in, in conversation that I move past what was bad or not right. Right. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, if I had continued with that life, it still would have been good. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think, you know, let's look back on Ignatius. You know, had Ignatius decided to return to the courts of Spain and live out his life, you know, that way, it would have been good. We wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah, it was not that good because we wouldn't be friends right now. There would no, but I mean, but he, it, I mean, God would pro- would still have been smiling upon him. Yeah, you're right, you're right. You know, but I mean, thank God, literally, that he discerned, you know, discerned the path that he chose as the pilgrim, you know, and stepping into really the unknown. And that's where, you know, that faith comes in, in that, in that listening, right. that still voice, that's risky. And that's, un, you know, that's, that's stepping into the unknown. Um, but that's faith saying that, you know, again, what you just said a little while ago, Mark, you know, seeking and finding God in all things, recognizing God's, God's accompanying me in this and right. just allow me to keep listening at a deeper level. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that one of the things that COVID has done for me as a Jesuit, and I, and I hear it on the p- many people that uh, I'm doing retreats with through Zoom, uh, through our uh, the prayer and daily life, is that um, there is a sense that part of their experience now in this, their spiritual life is how do they deal with either loss or maybe the word is um, uh, a pause, this, these pauses on all their hopes and dreams. Uh, the, the pauses and and I do think I do think Ignatius it asks us again in that discerning way to think about the fact that okay what do I have to give up right now but what do I but who am I even in the midst of giving that up am I still loved by God do I still love other people and just having those moments within prayer it's and it, 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 Ignatius continually reminds us in the spiritual exercises. You know, you are loved. You're not the center of the world, but you are loved. You, you are not the master of the universe, but you are loved. You have to give this up, but you are loved. And I just think that that's been part of my own experience of, 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 of how Ignatius has helped me through this, uh, through this pandemic. I think you, and you, you, you bring up something really, really key when you say, you know, that, that starting point of you are loved. Um, you know, there's that, that the old uh, American standard, you know, Nature Boy by made famous by Nat King Cole. And it concludes with the line, sorry, I had, to, again, I had to throw music into yeah, it. Of course, if I was going to do a poem, you had to do music. I was sure of that. Well, I got a stack of books here too for poetry as well, Mark. So, no, but there's the, there's, the, there's the line in the end of the song that says, the greatest gift you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. It's a beautiful sentiment, but I think it's the other way around. The greatest gift we'll ever learn is that we're loved and we love in return. Yeah. We always recognize the love first yeah. because the starting point is not me. The starting point yeah. is who is loving me, you know, and then to live out of that. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think one of the things uh, that, that we've talked about a lot, and uh, we've both been kind of um, influenced by so many spiritual masters in the Society of Jesus. One of the things that uh, David Fleming, the great spiritual master, uh, who passed away recently, well, almost a decade now. I have um, the first yeah, right exactly, here. David. But he once he was he once gave a talk about. He says, you know what, really, what this, the spiritual life is about, and what Ignatius of Loyola was, was about. Spirit was about freedom. Are you free? Because if you're free, that motor is then turns on inside your heart and your head, and you can do things. But most of us spend our lives kind of being, you know, kind of uh, bound up. And so freedom is about unbinding. I love Pope Francis's great um, 
uh, in, image of Mary as the untire of knots. Oh. I think it's a very Ignatian kind of devotion yeah. to Mary because a, lo a lot of the spiritual, to, to know yourself, to know your deepest desires is to really kind of have to move into some freedoms where we think we're free, but in many ways, I, I'm so shaped by the media. I'm shaped by politics. I'm shaped by my, my parents. I'm shaped by, all those things can be good if they're ordered to freedom, but there's sometimes in me disorder. So uh, a, a Jesuit spiritual director always tells me, Mark, give your ducks in a row, give your ducks in a row. <laughs> and, I, and I do think it's like, oh yeah, it's my head, my heart, my gut. Mm -hmm. Are they are they in sequence? I can find freedom when my thoughts, my desires, and my my gut instincts are all together. What do you think about that? Uh, of what? <laughs> Amen. Yes. <laughs> so, but, uh, you're preaching to the choir here, Mark. You know. Well, I know. I mean, That's why I like to talk to you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you bring up you know again you, you know at the heart of and and again with the spiritual exercises, and it's right in, again, the Fleming translation, you know, the purpose of these exercises is to lead an individual to deeper spiritual freedom. And as, you know, that word carries a lot with it, freedom, you know, what do we mean yeah. by freedom? And we're not talking some kind of uh, theory here or philosophical concept. What I appreciate what you just said when you said head, heart, gut it's it's embodied it's incarnate it's experiential yeah. and, and in that sense it's so very practical you know again we talk about Ignatian spirituality all the time and you know we have we have the book and you know we have all the movements of it it's um it's it's not a textbook right it's it's you know I, people will often say well i need to go read that and i'm like no you don't you don't go out and buy it and read it. I said, that would be like reading a cookbook. You right. have to do it. Right. Because that's what's so, um, again, that's what attracted me to Ignatian spirituality prior to entering the society was um, it, 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 it honored and, and recognized as sacred my experience yeah. and who I fully am. And so that notion of freedom, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier in terms of you know the desires and there's you know the the, the loud the loud wants and the more silent need right, right but it's all who we each uniquely are right 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 it's almost like a pivot isn't it greg from the free it's a freedom from which is i'm, I'm free from these these just one 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 i'm freed from all the different kinds of discursive things going around in my head and in my job and and it's and then and then in the second to the third week of the exercises, where we really look at following Christ, where we say, "Oh my gosh, Christ is the most free human person in the, that has ever lived." Right? That somehow it's freedom from these things to a freedom for, right? A freedom toward a right. movement with others, accompanying others with the same kind of of generous kind of heart, with a sense of the possibilities with a sense of basically compassion in the world, you know? So I think that that's the pivot for me in the spiritual exercises, you know, is that Christ somehow is, he, once we, but we have to be free from these things for us to really know Christ, that, that Christ is in, a, in us, right? No, you, we have to, right, you have to move, you, but the invitation there, and that's, I, I love what you said there, the invitation and challenge is that pivot <clears throat> to move from, you know, freedom from these things and then live into freedom for and again that's where coming to recognize who christ is yeah. uniquely for me it's well you know it as a tangent it's 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 uh often when i talk about our vows it's a freedom but it's not it's not saying no to things it's, it is in a sense but the no has to lead into the deeper yes yeah, right. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I like that. I, I've always, <clears throat> I've always had this sense that my vocation, and I think it's true of any vocation, is you come to that point where you have what I call the double negative. I cannot not do that. <laughs> and that double not is actually a positive thing, right? Two right. negative, right. positive. But, <laughs> but but you feel it in your body. It's like, well, I cannot not do it because you're taking risks. Uh, I mean, I think when somebody proposes to somebody, it's like. I cannot not do that. If I, 
I don't do this, something's going to be lost to me, right? Something's right. going to be closed down, but I find freedom. So, but I think it's kind of like, we kind of do the not, not this way, but then we realize that's a positive move, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really, it's really true. That's wow. Right. Um, you know, this, this, this idea that, you know, uh, Ignatius gives this gift of, of, of spiritual uh, freedom, uh, this desire, a discerning of spirits with, that's going on in our lives, um, a sense of order, ordering all the disorders in our life. Um, I'm wondering, you know, in your own life, Greg, how has this, how has the spiritual exercise, how has Ignatian spirituality kind of grounded you uh, right now in this moment? What's the most important thing in this moment uh, going through the uh, this pandemic with Ooh. everything going on? You know what has been a, a constant for me through the course of these months is, you know, there's that um, there's a meditation early on in the exercises where um, Ignatius, the, it, the retreatant is invited in to reflect, to reflect on the, the uh, threefold question, right? What have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? What ought I be doing for Christ? Right. And that's, and just follow me for a second, because this is, and this is, this is God at work. This isn't me. Um, that's been part of, of these months. But there was a shift, and and I can't tell you exactly when because these months have become somewhat timeless, right? Uh, outside of time, but there was a shift where, in moments, I started just um, the the question became, what has Christ done for me? What is Christ doing for me right now? Yeah. And what do I desire Christ to be doing for me? Mm -hmm. It was this, it was just, and again, <laughs> where did it come from? Not me. Yeah. From a much higher pay grade than mine. It was, it was, it was, I mean, it really, and that's really because you know what it, it, it has really in many ways, and it's not like this happens every day. I mean, I have, as we all do, tough days. Mm -hmm. But what it, it, it's been an invitation to returning to that foundational grace, virtue. That, Ignatian, that Ignatius really insists upon, and that's gratitude, right? Yeah. And in the midst of, again, in the midst of so much sure. loss and so much that has seemingly been stripped away, um, it's, it's, it's forced me to fall back into gratitude when I start saying, well, yeah, look at what Christ has done for me. Right. And look at what Christ in this moment is doing for me. And some days that's easier to see than others. Right, right, right. And then there are those, mo well, what do I desire mm -hmm. Christ to be doing for me? Right, right. It's, I think it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a crucial part of the spiritual exercise, without a doubt. Uh, that question, and, we, and you see it really coming through at the beginning and the end of these, these exercises. I, I think also, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna, uh, build on that and say, the question that has been for me is how can we be Christ for one another in a time of pandemic? And I feel like I've been called into um, a, a deeper sensitivity, uh, especially because of maybe the past summer, a deeper sensitivity uh, of, of, of people's otherness and how Christ is inside of them, calling them into new life, or how to look at our students, especially during this you know, time of pandemic through Zoom classes or even taking a coffee along, you know, along the street with our masks on, how do we become Christ for one another? Um, how do we, how are we free enough? That we know ourselves enough to let Christ live in us, you know, and and live in all the good things we want for, for one another. And so I think for me that came out of the fourth question. You know, how, how can I step aside a little bit and let Christ kind of work His mojo? You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then, again, that's that's uh, uh, you know that's that's you know again the discerning of the distracting desires and the authentic the right. deep desires. You know, what was that? You know, there you remind me of um, there was that prayer. Uh, Father Michael Judge, the Franciscan who um, was the first casualty of 9/11, um, because he was he was down there. He he was a uh, chaplain to the New York Fire Department. Right. That that short prayer that he had that he prayed every day, where it says, "Lord, um, please let me 
see what you want me to see, um, meet who you want me to meet, do who you want me to do, um, say what you want me to say, but Lord, just let me get out of your way. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think, I think, you know, not, it's, it's simple, but it's simple in theory. I think that's such, such the desire. Let me just yeah. get out of the way and let, let me, let you pour out into the world. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, I think it'd be a good idea, Greg, uh, if we tried to do, you mentioned gratitude, which of course is the starting place of the uh, Ignatian examen or examine. Do you say examen or examen? You say tomato, I say tomato. Yeah. I say exam only because like if somebody takes an exam, add an E-N to that, but that means nothing. Yeah. I, 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 end, up, I end up usually saying the, the, an examen. Because it, it doesn't sound like an examination, you know. I don't want to get kids off. That's you're right. That makes right. That's a nice. But, um, but so the examen. So I think the nation examen um, or the examen. You know, it starts with gratitude, and this is something that Jesuits pray every day. And a lot of our, our lay uh, colleagues and collaborators are really uh, are, are using this five to ten minute, uh, could be five, ten, fifteen minutes, depending on your time. Um, Ignatius said that if you wasn't it, it was Ignatius himself who said that if you only had time for one thing, if you couldn't have that half hour of prayer. Do not give up the examen. Right. And the examen is this five kind of points of, 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 of sitting or standing or breathing in gratitude, of, of, of reminding yourself that you're loved by God, going through your day, reflecting on uh, images, moments uh, that, um, that, that, were, that you, you were working your life through. And how, how was that? You know, evaluating it, you might say. Um, and then asking for, asking for God's offering, God's grace to help you do better, to be better, to, to create a, a, a more loving uh, and kind place with the people that you live with and all that. And then kind of ending again with a kind of generous heart, you know. Um, and and I, I, I'm sure you, you, you share this on the escape retreats, I think, with all the freshmen like every single time, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's, it's foundational to all of our retreats, you know. Yeah. Uh, and because it is so foundational to our, the, the, again, the spiritual worldview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think, so let's, you want to do like a four or five minutes? Should I lead a, an examen? And then we're going to open up for questions uh, from all of the people that are, are on with us here. Uh, and they might have questions that are about Ignatius spirituality or about anything else. Does that sound Perfect. good? That sounds all right. cool. So I'm going to ask anybody who's uh, with us, uh, accompanying us in this hour, we're just going to take about four or five minutes. And I'm going to ask you if you'll... Um, maybe uh, uh, just find a comfortable space to close your eyes. I'm gonna kind of do a, uh, I'm gonna lead you through the examen. Um, and, and we're gonna do it, uh, we've been looking at a lot of faces on, on the screen. And so we're gonna, this exam is just kind of an examen of faces, of the faces um, uh, in, in a time of Zoom. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna have this bell go off and you're gonna hear it just about a couple seconds. And that's when we were gonna close our eyes and we're just gonna breathe in some, some deep breaths. So I just ask you to take three slow, quiet breaths, breathing in gratitude, and exhaling, feeling your surroundings, but breathing in gratitude. And just Feeling that word and the power of that word, gratitude, one more time. Breathing in. Conscious of your mind and your body and your heart. I want you to use your imagination if it has your eyes closed. And just conjure up the faces that you love. One or two faces of this day, of, of the last couple of days. You just kind of conjure to keep that face before you in your imagination. Look upon that face with love. Say a word of gratitude to God that you have this wonderful face or faces that have loved you or that you love so much.
Take another deep breath in. Exhale. Let that, those faces go. And I want you to conjure up those, a face or two of people that, you know, can probably be a little annoying perhaps, or that face that you're still struggling to, to have a deeper relationship with. That face of someone that you know you love, but you have a hard time loving and liking. You just hold that face in your imagination. Hold it up to God in your prayer. And can you ask God to love that face the way it deserves to be loved? Then take a deep breath in and exhale. And can you conjure up the faces of those who really are on the margins of your life? Perhaps it's a homeless person. Perhaps it's something, a face you saw on TV or read about. Can you conjure up that face before God in you? And just hold that face in prayer. Ask God to bless that face and all those in need of being seen in our world, those people that are in need of being heard and seen in your life. And take a deep breath of the spirit one more time. Exhale. And maybe the hardest thing of all, can you conjure up your own face? This face loved by God. Can you feel how much God loves this face? How God wants so much for you. And can you ask God, what do I need? What do I deeply desire? And ask God to be with you. We take that deep breath in and we just do a couple, three or four more deep breaths, just asking for God for a generous heart to give us generous souls. To let his son, Jesus, work through us and in us. Thank God for the silence, as well as all the laughter. To thank God for being with us in sadness and anxiety. And finally, to ask God that we can recommit ourselves to one another. So that's a, a nice way to have a moment of prayer within the discussion of Ignatian spirituality. I, I really appreciate everybody going on that journey with us. Um, I know 
Greg and I, and, and so many of the Jesuits, we share the exam with our students. Um, I think it's, it's something that is not difficult and it's always so, um, there's so much gratitude about just stopping for five to 10, 15 minutes, yeah. Right. So without further ado, are there questions? I mean, you know, you have two Jesuits in front of you. We're gonna talk, you know, I'm just telling you, we can talk forever about, we can do poetry, we can talk about, you know, the spiritual exercises, um, but there might be questions. So I think Mary Prohinsky is gonna um, come on board here and tell us, ask us to see if there's any Q&A or something or questions that might be coming from the chat rooms. Yes, fathers, there are some questions. Um, <laughs> let me start with the first one. Um, how can we use Ignatian spirituality to help us with work-life balance when we're doing everything from home? Any tips? Okay, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, given the fact that um, my work and my life and everything else has you know, grown much smaller these days, um, I think, well, we just kind of practiced a way of doing that to be able to, um, first of all, carve out the time, be it five minutes, you know, for an exam. Um, but I, I also think it's important, and this is something we always talk about with, um, you know, the prayer and daily life, is to find a space um, in even the smallest of spaces to find you know, a space that you make really kind of your your own prayer space, your little sacred space. That's when you, it might be as simple, and I'm looking over at my chair right over there. It might be as simple as a, 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 just a chair in a space that you carve out and say, this chair will be for those five to 10 minutes. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of, a, you know, an intentionality, a mindfulness in terms of um, what is what is right around you and and creating, um, you know, bring out a candle, you know, something like that. You know, one of the things that I did, especially during the spring and summer with 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 folks who are asking about, you know, how do I how do I do this balance? I'd say, well, you know, you need you need these kind of sacramental reminders. So I said, print up the examen and tape it, tape it to your mirror. And when you're brushing your teeth, right. but you're going to brush your teeth for five minutes because I want you to you know, ask God about generosity, but you cannot not see it, so to speak, right? It's right there in the mirror. Um, or, you know, uh, another thing is maybe switch up a room. So take photos and put them in different places. See the world a little bit differently. Have moments of wonder, even if you can't get outside, change up a room so that you're, you, you, again, you see the faces that love you. You see the faces that have, have loved you into life. Um, just doing small little maneuvers like that. I think you're right, Greg, is really important um, during this. And then maybe find a find a way to just remember people. I, I feel like I'm praying maybe maybe more for uh, for others. I'm like my 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 list is long. Um, and so I, I I have a moment in my day where I, I, I just try to say, oh, and these are the people my, my mother said pray for, you know, pray for your aunt or a student says pray for, or we have a Jesuit who's uh, lost his dad recently, Father Jerry. Pray for the the the, the, um, the Hayes family, you know, that kind of a thing, and just kind of keeping a little running tab of. I mean, I have to write it down myself, and that's my week of just remembering the folks in prayer. So I think some of the balance is just not doing what you usually do, right, uh, and not being in the same place that you usually do it, right. and let God do the rest of the work. Just saying, okay, I'm open. Right. There's there's that co-laboring again. Yeah, yeah. It's stepping into that. It's such a great word, co-lingering. I like that. I like that very much. I hope that helps people, folks. Um, I, I will I'll, I'll mention one other thing. Um, my spiritual director once told me that uh, sometimes when you have it, instead of just doing a decade of the rosary, one time, you know, 10, 10 Hail Marys, when you get to the part that says, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for, just uh, add, the, add the 10 people that you want, to, want Mary to pray for. So Holy Mary, Mother, I pray for my mother. Now I'd be able to Holy Mary, Mother, pray for my my husband. Now at the hour of my death, Holy Mary, Mother of God. So when you just do those ten Hail Marys, and again, it's conjuring. You're not alone. You belong to these people. The Mother of God belongs to these people. God belongs to all of us. So those those would be my those would be my kind of hints. I just I had never I've never heard that before, Mark. I just wrote that down because I love that. Yeah, yeah. It was actually Father. It was actually Father Tim Godfrey. He used to work at Georgetown yeah. in yep. this department, and I did my eight day retreat. He was my director, and he asked me to do that. And I've always remembered that. What a um, what a great way of cracking open the the 
uh, Hail Mary. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Other other question? Yes, there are a couple others. Um, one um, for Father Greg, um, that since the Seminar for Vocation and Purpose is a student seminar, are there any things that we could read or look at to think about those questions um, that you and Dr. Lord have covered? Oh gosh, I would actually, I just, I just step in as guest in that class and I would have to look at what her, um, mm. what her syllabus looks like. Um, I'm not sure what she has on it. Um, and I'm just trying to think in terms of that notion of vocation and purpose. Mark, can you think of anything in terms of, in that in, in that context? There, there has been some stuff, some really good stuff written about um, using the word purpose and vocation. What's the call? What what's what do I feel I'm called to do? Um, I, I guess I could get you some um, some titles, but off the top of my head, I can't um, I can't recall anything. Uh, I do think one of the things that we're, that some of these seminars are trying to do is to uh, remind uh, our students of their own talent, their own giftedness, and seeing if they can put their talents and gifts together in a, in a generous way. So it is about always discerning. It's, it's really, I mean, what Jean Lord's doing is asking them to discern, right. really, isn't she? Yeah. Um, but if you, if, you, if you let Mary know that you, your question, and I can always email um, a couple of books that are just about, really about um, finding your, your personal vocation as a kind of yeah. A, a journey of discovery of, of awareness yeah and i could talk to i could talk to dr lord also and see what's on her syllabus okay. so if you want a, any kind of uh contact info i could i could look into that cool <clears throat> now you both have taught english can i jump in with another question uh, Ooh, you english. mentioned earlier in absolutely the about, <laughs> about the maj uh, about the majus about going deeper what can we read now to go deeper into ignatian spirituality or to help us with these with the questions of Zoom fatigue and, or not necessarily Zoom fatigue, but to give us a distraction from that. You both probably have lots of suggestions. I'll oh leave it to gosh. you. Oh my gosh. I mean, I find myself, I have a book, I have two books open on my desk, one of poetry, one, of, one that's a novel. I've got two books over by my bed. So partly, again, I'm one of those people that needs to see the object and run into it. And, uh, and that kind of gets me into my another, another space, but I would suggest reading poem, poetry right now. I would, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Mary Oliver, Denise Levertov, um, those poems that are so beautifully move us to a moment of wonder and awe, uh, those, those that, that, that take us on a journey through words uh, so that we can kind of inhabit those words. So that's the first thing I, I would say. What about you, Greg? What was your first? I, well, I was going to go on my music tangent. <laughs> there you go. And well, because this is all, this is also something about in terms of the Zoom fatigue. Um, there, there have been days where um, by the evening um, my eyes hurt, and well, I, first of all, I don't want to read on a tablet, and so actually, you know, picking up you know a text is a good thing, um, at least for me, but. I, I'm putting something in the um, in the uh, chat for everybody. This was an article that was in the LA Times way back in March. March, I want to say like 17th or 20th. It was all about the the, the lost art of deep listening. And I've, I've been doing this and it really has become a spiritual practice over the course of these months in the evening. And I don't do it every evening, but I sit down, put on my noise canceling headphones, put the phone away and I listened to a full album. Remember full albums <laughs> and you know, not just a song or a playlist, but listen to a full album by an art, a, a single artist. And I've listened to old stuff and new stuff and stuff that I probably should have listened to a long time ago that I never had and have just recently discovered. Um, but it's also just, just again, be still and know that I'm God, just step into and the experience of music and especially you can't go out and see live music. Um, there is a transcendent element to music that places us, can place us yeah, in the sacred and to step away from all the, the, the fatigue and everything else in the midst of it all. Yeah, yeah. And I do, I, you know, we all, we did the examen, I think just doing an examen, uh, doing one in the morning 
when you wake up, what do you want to, your day to look like? And, and, you know, again, there's so much about the exam and just even on the, on what the web that, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And then do, and doing a walking one, just kind of walk around maybe outside and just kind of having that kinesthetic moment can really lead to a kind of a different, it kind of displaces you from your, your occupation to your preoccupation. Good. I love the music one though. Yeah. Uh, Mary, I think we have time for at least one or two more. We do have um, one. We've got a question about is there something, can Georgetown send something daily each day? Um, I know we do that. Can you talk about what we do daily in um, later in, in some of the holy seasons of the year? Sure. So um, one of the things that I inherited, which is so brilliantly done by campus ministry, uh, is uh, these what we call the Advent devotionals and the Lenten devotionals. And so you can walk uh, for 30 days, I think, during um, Advent and Christmas and another like uh, 55 days, I think, with, um, with the Lenten devotionals. These are online, so you can see, you can get these emailed to you each day in the morning. Um, and, they're, and they're wonderful moments of using the scripture of the day and having our students, our staff, our Jesuits, our other chaplains, um, do a quick, re short reflection and just giving you a, a moment's pause. And uh, I think that those have been really extraordinary. Um, I get so many, I get so many emails uh, uh, from from alumni, especially, who uh, who are always so grateful for that uh, thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of work, uh, but the campus ministry does a great job of putting it together. Um, so those will be coming out. I think if you just write, uh, I don't know, who do you write? You probably write, I'm gonna have a, a poor Mary Brzezinski. Write Mary Brzezinski and she'll get you on the, she'll get you on the email list. And if you wanna, we actually do even um, paper ones, uh, some for, for, for some people uh, who would prefer that than just having an email each morning. Right. Great, uh, we, we can send a little summary report or summary list of the books you all have recommended in the links um, as a follow-up with people. Sure. Um, and then, um, one, we do have a question asking for um, yeah, people like to help us encourage the students who they're, who parents are teaching and assisting with at home. So um, to keep them in thought, or I mean, well, no, people, well, parents are supporting their students learning from home and um, just- So the question, them. I'm sorry, is this the question? Um, the question is um, that you've inspired them as they, as they are there to be a backup resource for their, um, students and the question is, are there any other tips you have um, as teachers, as faculty members? Um, and this, I know I'm going out in left field, Father, sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to get to that. I'm trying to circle around the question. The question is, what are, there some, what are some tools to help students get through their Zoom classes? Um, no, how to, how to um, mentor your children while they're learning from home and disconnected from their friends? Or are there, are there any tips you have about that? I think, I think love them a lot, uh, be patient with them. Actually, you folks do it better because you're there, uh, you know it. I think um, I'm, always, I'm in awe of people who are having, especially small kids at home, trying to make this work. Um, so just love your, love your kid, tell them you love them a lot. Uh, tell them that they're okay. I think, I think just that, that's all, that's all I can, can say. It's, uh, um, You've been given a vocation to be a mother or a father or a parent and um, uh, live inside that and really invite Christ into that when you uh, deal with your kids. And to, and to be patient with yourself. Yeah, yeah. You and know. yeah, and turn that around yourself. Love yourself and be patient with yourself. Exactly, you know, because, you know, saints, saints, uh, you know, saints aren't people who are perfect. Saints are people who keep trying. Yeah. What do they, what do they keep trying to do? They keep trying to love. Yeah. And it's not easy <laughs> yeah. all the time, but I think to be patient with that and um, to just keep trying to love, yeah. My favorite line from Martin Sheen when he was asked about, I, I hear you're a practicing Catholic. He says, yeah, I'm, I'm still practicing because I haven't gotten it right yet. Right. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna practice till the day I die. It's just the practice of love, the practice <laughs> of discipleship, the practice of, of forgiveness, mm -hmm. the practice of patience uh those kinds of things and, then, and we're back there to the modest right mark yeah to go in deep you know to each to desire to go deeper with each of those you know the love the forgiveness the compassion each day yeah. you know to desire and to pray for that grace you yeah. know yeah. that's great 
Well, I think our time's up because I've just heard I, I'm, I'm in Healy Hall and the bells, the 12 noon bells uh, here at Healy Hall have gone off. So we've been with you for a, a good time. We wish we could be here in person with you. Yep. Um, it, it, yeah, I'm just really, really so grateful for all of those working on this homecoming uh, weekend, um, have uh, put this together and given us the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to chat with you. Um, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to uh, back over to the, uh, those who are leading this um, uh, webinar uh, technology extravaganza. And, uh, and just wanna thank you again for all you do. Keep us in your prayers. Keep praying for Georgetown and our students, our faculty and staff, and we'll be doing the same for you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, Father Mark and Father Greg, for a really wonderful hour. Um, for those asking questions, we have recorded this and we'll post a link so you can watch it again. And please join us in future conversations uh, with Father Bosco webinars uh, that the Alumni Association sponsors. And uh, you're welcome to join us for Sunday evening masses from Dahlgren at 7 p.m. that are live streamed on the Georgetown Facebook page. Take care. All right. Ciao.